once again, we're able to come together to study the word of God. It's our prayer that you are well, uh, that all is going okay with you and yours. We pray for your health. We pray for your well-being. Uh, we are in a series of messages on change uh, as we deal with the reality of change, face the reality of change in our lives. Uh, we are going to begin our time in prayer as we always do. Uh, let us talk to the Father. Our God, our Father, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you for protecting us. Lord, we just pray as we enter into the study uh, that uh, what we share will touch our hearts. We pray you know, for all of those who are uh, listening, uh, that you would just watch over them, keep them safe, keep them uh, focused on you and your kingdom. Uh, those who are outside of the body of Christ, uh, we just pray that you would assess their hearts, uh, that they will obey uh, the gospel of Christ. It's in your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we're looking at this idea of change, I uh, want to uh, just remind you uh, what we looked at uh, last time. Uh, we looked at some of the changes that are surrounding us and uh, highlighted those very real changes going on all around us. Uh, but not only are there changes that go on around us, but there should be change within us. Uh, and that's perhaps the most difficult change, the change that happens within us. Uh, the truth of the matter is that the call to be a follower of Christ is a call to change. Uh, it is a call to uh, change uh, your profession. It's a call uh, that when the disciples answered it, they changed their profession. It, it's a cause or call rather to change our confession, uh, what we uh, confess and believe. It's a call to change our disposition. The call to be a follower of Christ is a call to change. Change will be a part of the life of a disciple of Christ for the rest of our lives. Uh, and we see this expectation of change in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Uh, now, on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him that the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices, who reported to him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in uh, Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Uh, when we talk about change, the Bible describes it as repentance. Repentance, a, a change of mind. It is a change of direction. And so change is expected. Uh, change is expected. And change takes place from the inside out. It takes place from the inside out, not the outside in. Uh, Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul here urges change. He says, I urge you, I, I beseech you, I beg of you by the mercies of God, you present your bodies, living sacrifice, uh, holy sacrifice, acceptable to God. Uh, what, what, what Paul says here, 
really won't mean that much to us if we don't understand and appreciate the mercies of God. Uh, Paul appeals to our understanding of the compassion that God has for us. Uh, when you understand who God is and what God has done, it helps you to listen to what God has to say. Uh, the truth of the matter is that good theology is a prerequisite to good liveology. Good theology is a prerequisite to good liveology. If we are going to uh, live in a way that embraces the transformation that God wants to accomplish in our lives, then we must have a proper view of God. Uh, the mercies of God compel us. And these mercies are the, ex the essence of the gospel. God knew that humanity needed him. And by his mercy, God provided a way for the sin of man to be erased so that we would have our need uh, for God feel. So God's mercies are significant. His mercies provide humanity with the power to be set free from the bondage of sin and escape the sentence of death so that we can live with Christ and God eternally. Uh, his mercies give us a purpose for living. Uh, see, uh, compassion, uh, the compassion of God compels us to make changes for God, uh, the mercies of God. And understanding that mercy compels us to make changes for God. It compels us uh, to sacrifice to God. And this sacrifice is not a sacrifice of bulls and goats. We don't bring a grain offering to the altar. What I have to offer is a living sacrifice. I don't just make a sacrifice. I am the sacrifice. So it says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. There's a definitive commitment of ourselves to the Lord. It is a once for all commitment that determines what we do with our bodies. Now, based on the mercies of God, we present our bodies to God as our sacrifice, our service to him. Uh, the sacrifice that we offer is our very lives. We're to be holy and to be an acceptable sacrifice. God should be pleased with what we offer him. The mercies of God lead us to change how we see ourselves. Because the body belongs to the Lord, we need to be careful how we present our bodies. Because my body belongs to the Lord, I should seek to take care of my body so that I'm able to give God my best. Our bodies are no longer to be agents of sin. They are to be instruments of holiness, a change is taking place. And the continual nature of the sacrifice means that my body belongs to God wherever my body is. Uh, it's not just a Sunday thing. I don't present my body as a living sacrifice when I'm at the church building or when I'm engaged in worship and uh, then take myself off of the altar. No, I'm a living sacrifice to God at school, at home, on the job, when I'm in the mall, when I'm playing ball, at the movies, when I'm on the phone, when I'm on the internet, when I'm texting, when I'm chatting with others, when I'm on Instagram, when I'm tweeting, when I'm posting on Facebook, I'm still a living sacrifice to God. And it's not the, just the absence of things that make me an acceptable sacrifice. It's not the absence of sin, but it's the presence of the evidence of the activity of God in my life that makes me acceptable. Uh, see, being holy isn't just about what we don't do. It's about who we are and who we are seeking to become in Christ. Uh, the Christian life is not about being empty, uh, where I don't do this and I don't do that and I can't have that. It's about being filled with all of the fullness of God. And so we present our bodies a living sacrifice uh, to God. And this presentation of ourselves is our spiritual service of worship. In other words, it only makes sense that this is what a Christian should do. What we offer to God is not just lip service. 
we are to offer God genuine, sincere, from the heart, giving of ourselves. God deserves all that we are and all that we have. And so Paul appeals to um, the mercies of God. By the mercies of God, he says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. Then he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, don't be conformed to this world. Conformity is perhaps the greatest hindrance to God's people truly being God's people. The pressure to look like the world, the pressure to sound like the world. Uh, Paul is telling the church here, stop assuming an outward expression that is patterned after the world because what you are doing does not come from within, nor is it representative of what you are in your inner being as a child of God. On the outside, you look like the world, but inside you look like God. Uh, he says, stop masquerading in the clothes of the world and the mannerisms of the world, the speech, the expressions, the styles, the habits of the world. There is a transformation that takes place and transformation means change. Uh, this masquerading that we do, uh, this masquerade costume that uh, saints sometimes put on hides the Lord Jesus living in us. Uh, and it is a dark covering through which the Holy Spirit cannot radiate the beauty of God within us. When we conform to this world, God is not glorified. And so the message to each one of us is to quit pretending to be something that we are not. Uh, see, the problem isn't that there are too many sinners in the church disguised as Christians. The problem is that there are too many Christians in the world disguised as sinners. Uh, it's not an issue of uh, we are faking it at church. Uh, it, it's more so we are perpetrating to the world that we are who we are not. Don't conform to the world because the transformation that has taken place and the change that has happened in you since you've been baptized into Christ is a change from the inside out. Now Christ's spirit indwells us. And so don't pretend to be something that you are not. Uh, don't be a sinner when you're interacting with others because that is not who God made you to be on the inside. You are a saint and what's on the inside should be reflected on the outside. So don't be conformed, but he says, be transformed, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, this word that's translated transformed uh, is the same as the word transfigure uh, in Matthew chapter 15, verse chapter 17, rather verse number two. Uh, it's the, uh, word from which we get the English word metamorphosis. It's described as a change within. What you look like on the outside is shaped by what's on the inside. And so on the mountain of transfiguration, where, where Jesus took Peter, James, and John, the glory of the Son of God was being hidden by his earthly body and when they were up on the Mount of Transfiguration, that glory on the inside that was being hidden by the earthly body began to shine so brightly that his radiance showed up on the outside. What was on the inside of Christ showed up. Uh, it, it transformed his look on the outside. And for the Christian, transformation happens by the renewing of our minds. Uh, see, Satan wants to change your mind but he can't do that from within because your heart has been occupied by the spirit of God. Uh, so the spirit has uh, occupancy of your heart. Satan can't get you from within. So Satan uses various tools at his disposal to exert pressure from without. Now, he uses the media. He uses your peers, your worldly friends and family members. He uses external pressure in an attempt to 
impact the radiance that is on the inside. And so uh, this world is the realm of Satan. And if the world uh, controls your thinking, you are a conformer. Uh, you will look like on the outside what you really are not on the inside. But if God controls your thinking, then you are a transformer. Uh, don't be conformed, be transformed. The Holy Spirit uh, changes our mind and he shapes uh, who we are by releasing uh, power from within. Uh, and so what we look like on the outside is shaped by the spirit that's on the inside. The spirit fills our heart with his fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And we have to decide who we want shaping our thinking. Uh, you can't think like the world and expect to be able to function like a Christian. Uh, ratchet thinking will never lead to righteous living. Uh, we have to lose our minds. We are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We won't look like the world looks. We will look like who we really are. A transformed mind will lead to a transformed life. We are to renew our minds so that we can determine what the will of God is in our lives. Uh, so many Christians struggle to identify the will of God in their lives because they have not renewed their mind. Uh, the thinking of the world will not reveal the will of God. You have to transform. You have to renew your mind. Uh, you have to get some of that garbage of the world out of your mind so uh, that the knowledge of God can permeate your mind. Uh, we are to show, we are to prove, to put to the test uh, what the will of God is is we uh, are to be those who see if what's going on in our lives is aligned with the will of God. See, as a result of the Spirit's control of our thinking, we're able to put our lives to the litmus test to see if we meet the specifications of being in compliance with the will of God. When we renew our minds, we are obedient to the word and discover what it feels like to have the word saturate our lives, saturate and control our thinking. Our lives receive God's stamp of approval. But we have been given the mind of Christ. We possess the spirit of God. And when we live transformed lives, the good, the acceptable, the perfect will of God is revealed to us with increasing clarity and focus. And so if you are dealing with confusion in your life, trying to figure out what the will of God is, evaluate uh, your mindset. Uh, do I have the word of God, the thoughts of God, the mind of Christ? Uh, is it influencing my thinking enough for me to come to understand and realize what the will of God is. If the Lord permits, next time we'll get into how we change. Uh, it's one thing to say change, uh, but how does that change take place? The word of God uh, shares some great insights uh, into how that change takes place. I hope you will join us next time. I uh, want you to end your time in prayer uh, just reflecting and thanking God for the power of his spirit to transform and to change our lives. Look forward to seeing you next time. May God bless you.